Welcome to the Salk Institute's Where Cures Begin podcast, where scientists talk about breakthrough discoveries with your hosts, Ali Akmal and Brittany Fair. Salk Professor Tony Hunter has been on the faculty of the Institute for 45 years. As a cancer researcher, he is known for his 1979 discovery of a genetic switch that, when flipped, can turn cancer on. Since then, he has won almost every award for cancer research there is. And yet, he remains one of the most down-to-earth people you'll ever come across. He is a beloved figure at Salk, usually seen wearing sandals and one of his signature t-shirts. We were thrilled to have the chance to sit down and talk with Dr. Hunter, Salk's Renato Delbeco Chair in Cancer Research, about his long tenure in science. You're wearing an interesting t-shirt today. It has an up arrow and the words collaborate, accelerate. What does that mean? This is one of the Stand Up to Cancer t-shirts that they gave us at various meetings to try and promote uh, the speed of, of finding treatments for the deadly cancers. So you're quite a t-shirt collector. Is there a story behind that? Or you just like t-shirts? Yeah, I have several hundred uh, t-shirts, of, usually from meetings, uh-huh. one or two from vendors. Um, I just sort of like collecting them. Uh-huh. And my wife doesn't like me collecting them, however, because <laughs> she thinks they take up unnecessary space in our closet. Yes, but I have, I have t-shirts from all the Salk meetings where we made them. So that's probably 40 or 50 over the years. How did you first become interested in science? Yes, I had a teacher in high school who was very influential. And the humanities didn't seem like quite the right fit. Well, Greek and Latin didn't really appeal to me that much. (laughs) So so, uh, my dad was an MD, and I think he he influenced the decision, no doubt. Mm. He got me interested in, in, in biology in general, and medicine particularly, because of his profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... It was really as a result of this teacher, biology teacher, in my last two years at school that I ended up in Cambridge reading natural sciences, that's a collection of sciences, and then specializing for my final year in biochemistry. I didn't really know what I was going to do when I graduated as with my BA from Cambridge and someone suggested that I should apply for a a studentship in the Department of Biochemistry to do graduate studies. I started as a graduate student in 1965. My first Nature paper was published while I was still a graduate student. And I never really thought that I'd still be doing science 50 years later. It just seems to have happened. And the time seems to have flashed past. Almost, I have an almost accidental career, I would say. You ended up coming to San Diego in 1971 and doing a postdoctoral fellowship at Salk. And then you returned briefly to England before being offered an assistant professorship at the Institute. That must have been so exciting. Well, I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time, I think. Particularly coming back here in 1975 put me right in the middle of a sort of a really exciting revolution in in cancer biology. I was lucky to stumble across tyrosine phosphorylation uh, because, as I've said many times, I was too lazy to make up a fresh buffer solution. Phosphotyrosine emerged unexpectedly. So there's a lot of luck involved in science and people that they they think it's all having good ideas, but, and good ideas are important, but it sometimes isn't a good idea. You stumble across it and provided you recognize what it is, then, then, then you've made a discovery. Dr. Hunter's serendipitous 1979 discovery of a genetic switch that turns genes off or on was groundbreaking for cancer research. The switch is the process by which a protein called a kinase attaches a phosphate chemical group to an amino acid called tyrosine. Malfunctions of the switch, called tyrosine phosphorylation, often lead to cancer. Here, Dr. Hunter tells us how the discovery happened. Yeah, so we were working on this small DNA tumor virus called polyomavirus. It's a 
as the name suggests, it causes multiple sorts of tumors and it particularly in rodents like hamsters. Mm. And it was late at night uh, in June, uh, June 21st, 1979, that uh, I was too lazy to make up a, a fresh buffer solution to separate the amino acids on a, a plate covered with uh, cellulose powder. Yeah, so then I was doing a routine experiment to try and figure out which amino acid was being phosphorylated, had phosphate added. And we believed it would be either serine or threonine, which were the two amino acids which had been reported over many, many years since the 19. 20s to be the phosphorylated residues in proteins. I set up the experiment where I took this radioactively labeled middle T protein out mm -hmm. of a, a gel and treated it with strong acid to chop it up into single amino acids mm -hmm. and then separated these amino acids together with some mixed in some uh, marker phosphoserine and phosphothrenine, the phosphorylated forms of serine and threonine. So I finished the run. It, that takes about 20 minutes. I dried the plate to get the, uh, the buffer off it. And then to find where the radioactivity was, you put the plate against a sheet of x-ray film, mm -hmm. which detects x-rays, but also detects radioactive decay. Mm -hmm. Came back um, the next morning and developed the x-ray film. And there indeed was a, a very faint, but a real spot. Mm -hmm. But it didn't overlap with either the phosphoserine or phosphothrenine. Mm -hmm. So it was something new. So if you had used fresh buffer solution to begin with, with a higher pH, you might never have discovered tyrosine phosphorylation. It was sheer luck, right, that I happened to be too lazy. That led to the understanding that this is really how the virus is, is making tumors. So at what point did you ever have a real eureka moment? Yeah, it wasn't really a eureka moment. It was a eureka two months, I guess. <laughs> There was a lot of excitement on the floor at the time when, I, when we presented this at the lab meeting. You know, people were very excited. And... Dr. Hunter is characteristically understated about just how big a discovery tyrosine phosphorylation was. Identifying it gave researchers a mechanism that could be targeted with drugs, like the anti-leukemia drug Gleevec, which was developed in the 1990s. It took a few more years before we realized this was also true in in human cancers, uh, particularly in chronic myelogenous leukemia, which is usually called CML, mm -hmm. uh, which is driven by the BCR ABL protein, which is a tyrosine kinase. Mm -hmm. So that was really the first evidence that tyrosine phosphorylation could play a role in human cancer, and then subsequently several other um, human cancers and human oncogenes were, were shown to um, B tyrosine kinases. And so that then led, you know, to interest in potentially targeting the tyrosine kinases in human cancer. But at that time, there weren't any selective kin kinase inhibitors known. And so that whole field had to evolve. And it's been able to turn um, basically a death sentence for CML into just making it a chronic disease that's entirely manageable. Right. If, if the disease is uh, diagnosed early enough when it's still in the the chronic phase, the indolent phase, then yes, um, many, perhaps 90% of patients who go on Gleevec, then the disease goes into remission. Mm -hmm. And many of the patients who went on Gleevec in 2001, when it was approved, are, um, are still taking Gleevec. A few of them have actually even stopped huh. because it Looks like the disease has been molecularly cured. It's eradicated. Wow. That's remarkable. You're part of the Conquering Cancer Initiative. Could you tell me about what it is, why it's important? Well, Salk has had a cancer center since 1973. The Institute's always been interested in cancer as a, as a disease to understand and hopefully to, to cure. Mm -hmm. And so the cancer center has, for the last, um, whatever it is, 45 years, 46 years now, I guess, has been pursuing this mission to try and understand cancer. And 
at a basic level, uh, fundamental level, and then um, to try and promote you know, the translation of some of our discoveries into 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 treatments. So this is our latest effort to try and really focus on specific cancers that uh, are the most intractable cancers, for which the, the tre current treatments are really not very not adequate. And they include pancreatic cancer, which is, by some measures, the most uh, deadly cancer. The tyrosine phosphorylation discovery was one milestone, and another was the 50th anniversary this year of his first paper in the prestigious journal Nature. Well, I bought a copy with me, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, wouldn't, you, it wouldn't make it into Nature now, I can tell you, but then, <laughs> then it was a lot easier. And yeah, it was really exciting to... Um, to get. I'd had a couple of other papers before that, but it was really exciting to get a get a first Nature paper. And since then, um, we've published uh, twenty six Nature papers over the years. Your latest one, just this year, is about pancreatic cancer. Can you tell us more about it? Yes, I started working on pancreatic cancer because um, my colleagues Ron Evans and Jeff Wall suggested I should join them in applying for, as part of a Stand Up to Cancer dream team to work on pancreatic cancer. Our goal was to try and understand the role of the non-tumor cells in the, in the tumor. And so our, our, my group's um, project was to try and figure out whether there were proteins, particularly cytokines, Messenger, uh, protein messengers that are um, able to communicate with the tumor cells. Pancreatic cancer is one of the deadliest cancers because the tumor is surrounded by an impenetrable shell of fibrous proteins and immune cells. These make the tumor hard to detect and hard to treat. Scientists have found that normal pancreatic cells, called stellate cells, can get inflamed and begin communicating with tumor cells in ways that promote the cancer's growth. Yeah, that was our model. There would be crosstalk between the two cell types, sort of a, a, a vicious cycle, if you like, of both cells maintaining each other. And we generated a catalog of all the proteins that the stellate cells make using a technique known as mass spectrometry to identify these proteins. And you zeroed in on one particular protein, is that right? Yeah, this protein uh, is a cytokine called leukemia inhibitory factor, or LIF for short, or we call it LIF. Mm -hmm. we, we focused on this partly because we knew that this, this cytokine was important in stem cell function, particularly in the embryo. So LIF is important for maintaining embryonic stem cells in a pluripotent state where they can make many different cell types from a single cell. And so it had interesting properties. It, it could potentially maintain a population of tumor stem cells, mm -hmm. and it could also potentially be involved in their invasive behavior. Dr. Hunter and his colleagues found that pancreatic tumors have high levels of LIF, which increase as the tumor progresses. But just because there is a correlation between two things doesn't mean one causes the other. The team needed a more direct connection between LIF and tumors. And so at that point, we decided we ought to test whether LIF is playing a role in the cancer. And so we obtained a, a, a monoclonal antibody, an antibody that can bind to LIF and neutralize its activity. Mm -hmm. And then we set up a preclinical model of pancreatic cancer. It's a mouse genetic model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we treated the mice three times a week with a, an injection of of the antibody, and we also combined that in half the mice with a chemotherapeutic drug, gemcitabine, which is the, was the standard of care for pancreatic cancer patients. And um, it's still used, but now in combination with other things. And we found that um, the antibody combined with gemcitabine slowed the progression of the tumor particularly. Wow. So that meant LIF was actually promoting tumor growth. Yeah, that was exciting. So it, it's something that you could target in human tumors. The idea as well. is that mm -hmm. we could, and the other thing we found out was that we could we could detect LIF in the serum of uh, both mice and, but importantly, in 
the serum of um, pancreatic cancer patients. So it could potentially be used as a biomarker for response to therapy in, in people. So that's a pretty exciting translational yeah, result. So this was really the first project I've ever had in the lab that's actually been translated into something useful wow. directly. I mean, obviously, many of the things we've done have been used by others to translate, but we haven't done that before. So towards the end of my career, it's exciting to have done at least one thing that's translatable. translatable. So it's going into clinical trials, is that right? Yes, yeah, so a small company in Toronto developed a, another uh, antibody that neutralizes LIF, the human LIF protein. And they initiated clinical trials in August last year, in August 2018. If you go back in time, what about the work you've done or the life you've led as a scientist would have sur surprised your, your undergraduate self or your graduate school self? You said you didn't think you'd be in science this long. It's pretty remarkable to think that I've been doing this for over 50 years now. I started as a graduate student, you know, really even before the genetic code had been solved. You know, we had no idea how many genes there were in an organism. Uh -huh. uh, and for a while during this early sequencing days, there were numbers ranging from, you know, 150,000 down to as many as 30,000. It turns out it's less than 30,000. I think that is a surprise that given the complexity of a human being that you only need 20,000 different genes to develop the body and to behave the way that we all do. That's, that's, that was a big surprise. Mm -hmm. So we had no real understanding of um, how, you know, how DNA encoded information and could direct the formation of cells and organisms. So that it was really the molecular biology revolution starting in the late 60s. Once, once the genome was sequenced, obviously we could catalog how many protein kinase genes an organism had, and we were the first to do that for the human uh, genome and, and reported that the kinome, that's the collection of protein kinase genes, mm -hmm. is 518 in, wow. in people. What else? I mean, there have been so many surprises along the way. I don't think it would have been easy to predict, you know, mm -hmm. many of these things. And I certainly didn't. You know, I was just, I was just happy to be part of some discoveries and um, to wonder at the beauty of nature, right? Just one of my last questions. Do you have any specific advice you would give graduate students or people considering graduate school in science? Well, in science in general, I mean, I, because of the rapid progress in the rate of discovery, sometimes people feel there isn't anything left to discover, and that's absolutely not true. There's clearly a lot more still to discover. I always tell people when they're embarking on a career in science, when I'm interviewing, you know, prospective graduate students for the biology program. Um, it's important to, to ask um, a question that if, if it's answered will have an important outcome. Yeah, you know, it's a hard job in the sense that uh, it's not really a nine to five job. <laughs> you have to spend extra hours in the lab and even on weekends. And, um, but you're rewarded by being able to travel around the world. Mm -hmm to meetings and you know you can take a day off when you feel like it as long as you can organize your experiments mm -hmm. it's not as though you have to be in the lab nine to five you can you can do it on your own time provided you get it done mm. and there's lots of great t-shirts in it lots for of people. great t-shirts right join us next time for more cutting edge salk science At Salk, world-renowned scientists work together to explore big, bold ideas, from cancer to Alzheimer's, aging to climate change. Where Cures Begin is a production of the Salk Institute's Office of Communications. To learn more about the research discussed today, visit salk.edu slash podcast. <laughs>